Welcome to Occult of Personality, esoteric podcast extraordinaire. I'm Billy Hepper, and Greg Kaminsky is your co-host. Now, in episode 214, we have the return of Freemason and author Jamie Paul Lamb to discuss his most recent book, The Archetypal Temple, and other writings on Masonic esotericism. Jamie Paul Lamb is an astrologer and tarotist practicing in the context of the Western occult tradition. He is the author of three books on the subject of Freemasonry and Western esotericism. His first book, Myth, Magic, and Masonry, Occult Perspectives in Freemasonry, followed by Approaching the Middle Chamber, The Seven Liberal Arts in Freemasonry and the Western Esoteric Tradition, and his new book, The Archetypal Temple and Other Writings on Masonic Esotericism. You can find Jamie online at www.jamiepaullam.com. Occult of Personality podcast is made possible by you, the listeners, and by the subscribers to chamberofreflection.com, our membership website, who aids us in the cause of informed, authentic, and accessible interviews about Western esotericism. Thank you again. Because of your support, we're able to bring you recordings of this caliber and many more to come. Anathema Publishing Limited. Quality occult books and contemporary esoterica. Established in 2011, Anathema Publishing aims to provide superior literature in content and form by creating a trinosophic relationship in troth and gabo between publisher, author, and reader. Anathema Publishing produces refined books for the true bibliophile on topics ranging from Gnosticism, traditional craft, alchemy, hermeticism, witchcraft, to Luciferian theosophy. www.anathemapublishing.com Please remember, we are in the midst of our Meditations on the Tarot study circle that is open to all Chamber of Reflection paid members. Later in May, we'll be meeting to discuss the Pope Hierophant chapter. We invite you to join us as we continue to explore this great spiritual classic. In the second half of our interview, available to members at chamberofreflection.com, our Patreon, and premium subscribers to rockfin.com, Jamie Paul Lamb delves even deeper into the content from his latest book. We talk about astrology, tarot, hermeticism, and much more. Join us for that wonderful conversation. I'd like to remind you that although you're able to listen to this podcast at no charge, it costs time and money to create. We ask you to support our efforts and the creation of future podcasts by joining the membership section at www.chamberofreflection.com or subscribing via Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash occult of personality. We are excited to announce that we have now added Square as our new payment provider in addition to PayPal to provide you with more convenient payment options. As always, if you're already supporting the show or have done so in the past, my heartfelt thanks and I salute you. The intro music is Awakening by Paul Avgarinos. And the outro music is Fortune Lies Freedom by Sean Harris. Brother Lamb, I want to thank you for joining us again and and sharing your wisdom and light with us. Uh, It's really a pleasure to speak with you and um, we're thrilled to have you. Brethren, it is a pleasure, an honor to be on again. Uh, like I said, I was really looking forward to this, and uh, uh, you know, happy Vernal Equinox. Though, though this isn't probably coming out on the Vernal Equinox, we're recording it uh, at least at my local meridian. It's been about an hour and a half since it went exact. It was eight thirty-three um, Mountain Standard Time this morning, so we're within orb of a pretty exact vernal equinox right now excellent awesome 
a very auspicious timing. Yeah, yeah. You know, I went outside um, right when it went exact, and I had picked up a couple of years ago. We were at Teotihuacan near Mexico City, and I picked up a uh, one of those obsidian, like five inch obsidian mirrors or discs, like the one John D had. And you could pick those up all over the place down there because they're sort of local to that area or whatever. So I picked that up. I went outside at 833, and uh, you could actually look at the sun through it. it it's a little bit, what's the word, opaque, I yeah. guess. It's, and uh, and I was, you know, just did a little thing there with my obsidian disc as the, as they were wont to look through those anciently in the area so it was yeah i thought that would be something nice to do i was gonna have my wife come out she was in the shower though and missed it she was bummed but whatever pretty cool though that's awesome yeah. very cool yeah all right so jamie i feel like you're a regular here on a call to personality you've been on the show several times i think most of our listeners are pretty familiar with your work but maybe for the newcomers to the show could you just share some quick background on who you are and what you do sure my name is Jamie Paul Lamb. Um, I'm a Freemason. Uh, I'm a frauder of the Hermetic Society of the Golden Dawn. I'm a member of the Societis Rosicruciana in Civitatibus Federatus, or if we do hard seas, so Kiatas Rosicruciana, etc. And uh, yeah, I've been, you know, involved in this sort of these sort of studies for over ten years. I've written a few books. The first one was Myth, Magic, and Masonry uh, of 2018, um, the, which, you know, the title kind of says what it's about. And then Approaching the Middle Chamber, which I came on the show about. Um, I was on a cult of personality, I guess it was two years ago, Greg. I think um, so. That came out in 20, I want to say. And then last year in 21, The Archetypal Temple came out which is sort of a collection of essays which you know i'm sure we could talk about more but um oh yeah and i'm this is kind of a milestone for me is uh i've been worshipful master of my blue lodge for the last nine months or so uh we do two-year terms so i still have a stretch to go but uh that's been really interesting um i mean in a rewarding way but it's a challenge too you know it's like i never expected that and i never it was never my design to go to the east in my blue lodge you know i had gotten you know i stepped out of line at senior deacon years and years ago and then uh and then i went behind the organ so i was lodge musician or lodge organist in several different blue lodges for you know up until i got moved to the east nine months ago and um you know again with no design on doing that you know and kind of having to sound it out and feel it out and rely on a lot of people and delegate and it's been really i mean so much growth in these last nine months maybe more so than the preceding 10 years or so hmm. wow yeah it's fantastic congratulations on that yeah thanks Still some time left on that, though. So it'll be nice to be able to say past master of Ascension Lodge number 89. <laughs> um, but and, it, you know, it kind of not to get too into the Masonic minutia, because I know the scope of your podcast is much more broad than that. But um, the, it gave new meaning to when we talk about the three lesser lights, which are the sun, the moon and the master of the lodge. If we think of the sun and moon as sort of these opposite poles, I guess, you know, in a sort of, I guess, vaguely alchemical sense that there's this uh, mysterium conjunctionis that happens between the sun, sun and the moon. And there's this mercurial sort of fulcrum at which they are, you know, mercury being the universal solvent kind of bringing these together. When they say the sun, the moon and the master of the lodge, you really understand the gravity of that sitting in the east because it's a constant like balancing act you know trying to gauge the collective sort of will or the egregore of the lodge and keeping that healthy etc certainly well spoken 
I just wanted to dive right in and just say um, congrats on your new book, The Archetypal Temple. I just think it's phenomenal. I have to say it's actually the first book that I've read by you. I've had your books on my my reading list for a while now, but I'm glad I, was, I started with this one just because I think it's so immediately accessible. Like I love that the subject matter just ranges from you know Kabbalah to Hermeticism and you know all within the context of Freemasonry. And it's presented in these kind of shorter essays, so it really allows you to kind of digest the information before moving on to the next one. So I really enjoyed it. I think there's just so much variety there that I think any any Mason, even non-Masons, you know, no matter if they're brand new to the craft or seasoned veterans will find a lot of richness there in the book. So congrats on that. Can you just tell us a little bit about your approach of putting together this book and, and the choice to maybe release all these shorter articles on different topics? Yeah, it's really kind of strange how that happened is uh, I know, Greg, you've read Approaching the Middle Chamber and we've talked about that in depth and you know that it's basically a doorstop. I mean, this thing is a brick. It's almost 500 pages. It's very information dense and it's, uh, you know, it goes from start to finish through the um, the middle chamber lecture or the fellow craft lecture in the second degree of masonry and minutely, I sort of minutely dissect all the crucial points of that with a touchstone being Western esotericism and how this kind of, you know, just kind of, because that's my perspective more broadly, I just uh, always kind of go back to that to weave that into the fabric, you know, of what we're talking about, because I believe a lot of it's there to begin with, but, you know, it's also nice to highlight that. And, you know, it's not for everybody. It's not for every Mason, you know, but it is uh, my perspective and it's what I had to offer. And the reason why I decided to go with shorter essays and more digestible work in this one is because part of the critique of approaching the middle chamber was um, was the density of information and how it's um, it's formidable. I mean, like, just like when you would read Pike or Mackey, you know, they use specialized vernacular, you know, I mean, obviously it says um, on the seven liberal arts, and, you know, in the context of the Western esoteric traditions, you know, so that right there should tell you that, okay, this is not only going to be about, you know, a certain specialized aspect of Freemasonry or a particular lecture, which is already a little abstruse, and it's our most difficult lecture in terms of the content. Not only are we going to be touching on that, but there's the extra curveball that we're going to be tying that to various um, traditions of Western esotericism. So it's like, as a writer, there's a formidable task there, you know? So it's like, who precisely am I writing this for? I know that's like the first question a writer should ask when they do something. And me being kind of still green at that point, I had one book under my belt, you know, which was also a collection of essays, really, because it was, my work over the preceding 10 years that was myth magic and masonry but um approaching the middle chamber you know was um you know it's again it's formidable you know like picking up morals and dogma or something it's easy to be like okay where are we again what are we talking about like how much how much googling do i have to do to make sense out of this thing you know so um so I understand that critique and with that in mind, and I, you know, I'm not a baby. I'm not going to be like, Oh, this person doesn't get me, man. They don't understand what I'm trying to do here or, you know, X, Y, and Z, whatever defensive argument you would put up about that. I decided to um, take that to heart and be like, okay, what can I do then to have a little more broader reach? What can I do? What, if I'm going to put something out there publicly, why am I going to make it something that's impenetrable? You know, so I decided, to, but I wanted to temper that with keeping it still very um, substantial. 
You know, so I feel like having pieces that can be read in one sitting, start to finish, where an idea is proposed, developed, and concluded, one kind of sitting, you know, it could easily be, frankly, a bathroom book. You know, these things, they're they're generally, let's say, in the neighborhood of 1,500, 2,000 words each. You know, you could sit down and read that in, what, 10, 15 minutes tops? And and there's a whole idea that's developed in that. So and then it ends, you know, and then you can move on to the next one and you don't have to worry about sort of concatenating this uh, theme throughout it. Um, But again, that being said, I I do believe there is a theme behind not only Freemasonry, behind all these essays that comprise the archetypal temple. I, I believe that the theme is this idea of the microcosm and the macrocosm and the idea of building, which I hope we can get into because that's the central premise, is uh, building this metaphysical ladder, much like Ficino's chain, chain of being, you know, forging these links that connect the microcosm and the macrocosm. And we have a spe- – in Freemasonry, we have a specific sort of – schematic already there it's in our work and it whether we know it or not it uh helps us to and it's the temple archetype that connects us from the physical let's say um you know asia to absolute you know there's this whole or going up the tree from malkut to kether or whatever system you want to use a neoplatonic theurgical kind of ladder or uh, a mithraic sort of planetary ladder. Uh, I think all of those themes of ascent are intact in Masonry's work. And, and we, we basically don't, I don't know. I don't want to judge the entirety of the craft, but I, I think it's something that's under addressed, let's say. So I wanted to, fill that kind of gap in what we're talking about. And in doing so, I know I've had a little coffee. You might be able to tell. (laughs) So, um, so uh, in doing that, um, I kind of reoriented, I had to ask myself, like as a first principle in organizing these, these essays, what is a Freemason and what is Freemasonry? So, that's not as easy as it sounds because even if you look in a dictionary or whatever, Merriam Webster's Oxford dictionary online, they're very circular. A Freemasonry does Masonic stuff is essentially what it says, which is doesn't mean anything. Right. And then, then there's the old definition of Freemasonry. If I could remember it, the very popular sort of Mackeyism, which is, uh, uh, a system of morality veiled in symbols and illustrate or illustrated by symbols and veiled in allegory. Does that sound right? Yeah. 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 That's kind of the quick grab, but, um, so two or three more sentences. Um, so I decided to go back to how do we reduce this and what do we call, let's say Freemasonry first, because that'll dictate what a Freemason is. So if Freemasonry, as opposed to operative stonemasonry, is still temple building, but on the metaphysical speculative level. So I would, my sort of postulate is Freemasonry is the art and science of speculative temple building, because that's what a mason does, right? Generally, So whether on the physical or metaphysical. Could you talk a little bit about how doing that occurs in Freemasonry because it does happen. Um, but it's, it's, it's often not really viewed as an esoteric practice, but I think a lot of that is just because it's not really understood in the proper perspective. Right. So I can preface that by saying there's an article or one of the essays in here. Let me remember the name. It is, uh, it is squaring Freemasonry with Western esotericism. So I essentially use um, Antoine Favre, rest in peace. I use his uh, criteria, you know, which 
Honograph, um, agrees on uh, good Rick Clark. They all sort of concur on these four, I think it's four, um, primary and two secondary criteria by which we judge what is precisely a Western esoteric tradition, what qualifies as a Western esoteric tradition. And I'm not, I can't do it now, but I went through point by point and, um, situated Freemasonry squarely within every, the four primary and the two secondary, like in what I think is a pretty unquestionable way, Mm. you know, I'm willing to listen to arguments otherwise, of course, but, um, I think it's in there. So first having done that, um, then we could say, what are these elements to your question? What are these elements of Freemasonry that that sort of um, exemplify, uh, let's say, this cli- the climbing of this metaphysical ladder, which mm-hmm. is essential to, I think, all species of Western esotericism, right? Um, I I say that that's the the temple archetype, right? So. And using those words in their classic sense, the archetype, like you have an archetype as such, which exists abstractly, like a platonic idea or form. Mm -hmm. And then you have archetypal images that sort of go down the chain from rarity down to density, Mm -hmm. just like we have in every single esoteric tradition in the West. I mean, we have this this, um, chain from density to rarity that connects the microcosm to the macrocosm. And you find that intact in Freemasonry through this temple archetype that we build, that we build historically. Um, we build that classically when we do our research on, let's say Vitruvius and architecture, classical architecture, et cetera, the five orders. Um, we have the mnemonic temple, which I think is probably one of the most important cha- uh, links in that chain. Mm, yeah. Because as you know, I think, Billy, you're a Mason too, right? Mm-hmm. I am. So uh, you know that whether you like it or not, if you're meeting proficiency and doing your memory work, you are going to have to build a mnemonic temple. And in our lectures, we are constantly orienting ourselves. We are. Then I went to the northeast, where I was put on the first step of Mason. Then I went to the south, to the west, to the east. And there's all these orientational terms, and all of this what what they would call oral formulaic composition, like in the Homeric or Hesiodic sense. And there's all these things that help us, whether consciously or unconsciously, to build this mnemonic temple. And what I think is the most interesting kind of um, sequence in this chain, uniting the microcosm and the macrocosm is this passage from the the individual mnemonic temple that we have all built through our memory work and meeting proficiency and being in offices in a lodge, let's say passing from that individual level to the egregorical level, which is sort of our gateway to the higher rungs of that ladder. And, and I have a way of explaining that like holographically. So if each individual Mason, let's say the three of us creating a micro egregore right here, um, each of us have done a degree of mnemonic work and we each have our mnemonic temples intact. So if we were to consider uh, the temple collectively between the three of us, we are then each sort of, let's say, keeping with that holographic analogy, projecting our particular individual temple from three vantage points, which is creating this egregorical hologram, basically, you know, just as a hol- I'm I'm not sure exactly how holograms work, but I think that there's projections of light that meet at certain vertices and create an ostensibly, uh, ostensibly uh, physical structure, right? So I think of a an egregore as functioning, the egregorical temple as meeting that certain mm. sequence. Interesting. 
Yeah, I have to say this part of the book got me super excited. It was probably like my favorite chapter was your chapter titled The Archetypal Temple. Mm -hmm. Um, Just because it made me think a lot about my own experience, something that I've noticed ever since becoming a Freemason. Um, I've never been a super visual person. I've always kind of struggled a bit with stuff like meditation where you have, you know, heavy visualization techniques. But one thing that I've noticed now ever since becoming a Mason I can, with with no trouble at all, I can close my eyes and I can situate myself instantly. I could do it right now within my Masonic Lodge room, within that temple space. And, you know, I can picture myself sitting in the chair of Senior Deacon. That happens to be the chair I'm, I'm occupying right now. Mm-hmm. You know, I could look over to my left. I could see the Worshipful Master. I can look across the room. I could see the Senior Warden. I can situate myself instantly within the Lodge and the the decorations and the symbols and the altar and I can form this kind of time-space environment, which I think is what you were talking about. Exactly. I can, yeah, I can, I can inhabit that space. I can get up and move around within that space. I can practice the ritual in, in my mind. Mm-hmm. And, and this is all pretty new for me. I mean, you know, it might not be for you guys, but I didn't really have that ability before. And it's just like something clicked when I began to immerse myself within Freemasonry. And I think a lot of it is partially due to these powerful memories that we have of being, you know, initiated, passed, and raised within that temple space. You know, you have those strong mental associations with that space in particular. So I don't know. I just want to take note of that because it's something that I've personally experienced and and what you wrote really resonated with me. There, there is something going on that's very real and very profound with this idea of the Masonic temple occupying several different planes of reality. Yeah. And, you know, to your point, um, A, senior deacon's a great position. I congratulate you on that. You get to do so much great work. I, I view that as uh, the most hermetic of the of the offices in a yeah. Masonic Lodge, being the herald or the Karuks or whatever. You know, mm-hmm. you're it's a, and you you guide the candidate through the quote unquote underworld at a yeah. certain sequence in our ritual. I mean, there's just so much hermeticism about senior deacon. It's a beautiful position, but, um, to your point about, uh, whether, you know, you were saying, I just started to think of it this way. Um, some people go through and never explicitly think of it that way. I think, right. I'm not in their minds, but I would gather that this is not a common thought among Freemasons. You know, I'm erecting a mnemonic temple, you know, (laughs) that's going to be a link in a chain that connects me with the house not made with hands eternal in the heaven, et cetera. But um, but they're doing that anyway. And I think that's part of the value of Freemasonry is that it's you can be the squarest Mason in the world, the most what I don't mean this disparagingly, but the most knife and fork fraternally oriented philanthropic mason who has zero interest in alchemy kabbalah astrology magic etc you can have no interest in any of that but if you are doing your proficiency and you are doing your mnemonic work and things um you don't have to be conscious of that to be engaged in that particular mechanism Mm -hmm. or meta mechanism or whatever You know, it's, um, that's the beauty is like, we, yeah, we could talk about making good men better and all of these platitudes and stuff, but there's, there's a schematic for that and it's in there. And I view it as almost, you know, the purloined letter, Edgar Allan Poe, you ever read that one? Um, the purloined letter, basically this guy steals a letter. He has to hide it from the authorities. It's a very, uh, potentially damning letter for this one socialite so he and there, he knows that they're going through their room to look for it so he suspends it from a ribbon like essentially in the middle of the room in the most obvious place you can put this thing you know and they never find it because it is literally in the most obvious place it's in the middle of the room hanging by a, a, a ribbon and i kind of view this um, archetypal temple concept as being almost the purloined letter of Freemasonry. We never talk about it, or rarely, you know, but it is like, so I, it is, for my money, it is the central project of Freemasonry. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not trying to define that for anybody else, but 
you know, if you want to read my book and judge for yourself or come at me with any kind of criticism about it, I will listen. You know, I will change my mind. I will look like a fool if 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 I'm wrong, I will be like, you know what? I'll wear a dunce cap for um, an equinoctial phase. No, I definitely think you're right on the money with this one, and it's there's so many so much evidence of it. Uh, really, the way sort of like holding an ideal in your mind and then inhabiting it physically and then working with it in a sort of in the mind you know visualization and memory the words like literally patterning the behavior uh and it's it's very much similar to like the patterning of a lot of other types of meditation just different forms and ultimately intention perhaps, but it does work to bring one closer to the ideal. You know, you have to kind of aim high, you know, if you're going to improve in, in any way, shape or form. Um, and you mentioned with regard to the temple, this idea of Jacob's ladder and sort of going from our current state to a, a through a transformation to a more refined state. And uh, in uh, one of the chapters in this book, I really loved, you talk about the cherubim and they're also associated with Jacob's ladder. And I'm wondering if you could talk about how the cherubim are encountered in Freemasonry and their significance symbolically and, and ultimately historically, because just the fact that they're present there creates links with, with earlier traditions. Certainly. So I think um, if I'm not mistaken, Ezekiel was part of going all the way back, right? Ezekiel was part of the Babylonian captivity. I think that's correct. So um, Ezekiel in Babylon would have encountered the Lamassu and the Lamassu are these sort of sphinxes that consist of a lion you know, pieces of a lion, an eagle, a man, and a uh, an ox or a bull. So the Lamassu were used as sort of um, apotropaic uh, symbols. They guarded portals generally, and they were, um, among other things, but they were very prestigious figures in statuary at, you know, at certain temples or ziggurats. And Ezekiel would have certainly encountered these figures because they were pretty ubiquitous in Mesopotamian cultures going all the way back to, if not the Sumerians, at least to the uh, Akkadians. Mm. And certainly in the Assyro-Babylonian sort of milieu, right? That They would have been present there. So they, knowing that they would have been encountered by anyone in, during the Babylonian captivity, I think it's pretty telling that we hear from Ezekiel that when he does encounter essentially what the, the Merkaba, the chariot, right? When he encounters this chariot, it's being held up by, um, you know, first he talks about wheels within wheels, bad paraphrase, right? But wheels within wheels, uh, having eyes all around them. Um, and then in the midst of this, there are uh, these cherubim, which have four faces, um, and they make mysterious movements and things. And um, and these four faces, he describes, are that of an ox, a lion, an eagle, and a man, which are precisely the component or constituent parts of a lamasu, right? Now... Even going back to Babylon, they directly associated this with the four royal stars or the Persian royal stars, which are situated essentially in the constellations um, Taurus, Leo, Scorpio, and Aquarius, the four fixed signs of the zodiac. So, and they were great astronomers and astrologers, the the 
all of the Mesopotamian cultures, the ancient Mesopotamian cultures. They're the ones who gave us the 360 degree circle, let's say. Um, they gave us the zodiac. So there's a, when we talk about bringing this back into Ezekiel, when we talk about wheels within wheels, you know, that can easily be construed as cycles of time. And what is astrology but the sort of study of time and its sort of implications? And to have those, what, what they might in Perso Arabic astrology called those stakes, these four fixed signs forming this cross, essentially, on the ecliptic. Um, I'm trying not. To, I'm trying less and less to get so jargony, and I want to be able to. Like, it's a personal project of mine. I want to be able to explain these things to a five-year-old or somebody's grandma. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to get there, but as you can tell from reading my books, I'm a long way off from that uh, because it's just. I don't know. It's just so hard to like find that middle road. Anyway, so Ezekiel. And now consequently, let's flash all the way forward to um, masonry where we encounter, or at least um, in the vicinity of masonry, like the Royal Arch, let's say, Um, which is another short digression, which I think it was Preston who said, Freemasonry shall consist of three degrees and no more, three degrees and the Royal Arch, Mm -hmm. he said. So I have a hard time just because if you've done any of the Royal Arch work, I'm not talking about the council or the commandry. Just the chapter. Just the the chapter. It's of a piece. It's what we're talking about in the Blue Lodge, too. Mm -hmm. I believe it should be brought back in, but that's a personal opinion. Mm -hmm. Um. Anyway, so in the Royal Arch, we find the banners of the tabernacle, which are associated with a tribe um, and are also associated with a certain uh, zoomorphic glyph, let's say, or an animal, right? And they are the, the lion, the ox, the eagle, and the man. And I forget their attributions, but it's like Reuben, um, Judah, uh might have to help me there. I forget which what the other Naphtali is like a deer or something like that. Anyway, they're associated with the tribes mm-hmm. and with these animals, these zodiacal, these fixed zodiacal animals. Also in the in the Royal Arch, um, um, on it on the banner of the Royal Arch, you'll see this heraldic crest, which is divided into four segments basically, and there they are present there again. Uh, they're of course in the tarot if we wanted to get off to the side I mean not that that's too far off to the side because at every crucial juncture in the development of at least occult tarot from Court de Jebeline all the way through let's say Paul Foster case or something like that at every point in between at every developmental or evolutionary period in the story of the tarot of Freemason has been there every single time, <laughs> every single time. So, so from court de Jebeline to the Comte de Millet, who was the first to assign the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. To, he was a Mason court de Jebeline was a Mason. Um, Eliphas Levy, um, uh, Arthur Edward Waite, Paul Foster case, even Manly P. P. Hart, uh, Manly P. Hall. All these people were Masons who've had, any dealing with these uh, really paradigm shifting kind of points in the development of the tarot. That's pretty remarkable. Yeah. Yeah. So, (laughs) so yeah. And I would say again, there has not been one point of real consequence in the development of the tarot that didn't have a Freemason there, kind of the inverse way of looking at that. Um, Anyway. So yeah, those four living creatures, this tetramorph, these cherubim, whatever context you want to kind of view them from, are uh, so central to astrology, um, uh, scripture, mythology, uh, and Freemasonry in a certain specialized way that uh, I felt it was important to uh, address that. Yeah, thank you. I'm just going to dive right in and get my other big 
GC question out of the way. And um, this was a, a takeaway that I had from the Earth chapter on uh, meaning making in Freemasonry. And this to me really got to the heart of like this question that we get all the time, like why bother with Freemasonry? Like what are the kind of tangible benefits that someone's going to get from joining the craft? And to me, and this is reflected in your chapter, you know, so much of it comes back to meaning, which is something that we're all searching for in this life. And, you know, Freemasonry can't give you all the secrets to the great meaning of life, but what it can do, like you said, is send you on this kind of quest dedicated to finding deeper levels of meaning in, in everything that we encounter, you know, through art and through philosophy. It gives you this kind of interpretive lens. And, you know, a lot of like friends and family will ask me, you know, why do you guys care so much about these old dusty rituals and titles and traditions? Like, come on, isn't it just kind of like a bunch of guys role playing and, and cosplaying and in funny outfits? But I mean, the answer is it's important to us because of the very fact that we make it important. You know, we observe these practices of Freemasonry with solemnity and respect. And if we do that long enough, it becomes meaningful. And that's really the whole purpose of engaging in ritual, particularly with rituals in a group environment like Freemasonry, because we're participating in a tradition that forms these powerful bonds. And it ultimately introduces us to a different way of seeing the world, of interpreting, you know, symbolism in a deeper way. So we we go through this sort of transformative narrative that you talked about where we elevate ourselves out of the mon mundane everyday lives and we kind of become the hero of our story. It's this heroic journey. And I think that's really important. I think particularly for men, if I could make that distinction, to discover this whole sense of meaning and this view of, you know, viewing our, our life in a more kind of mythological, imaginative terms. So anyways, that's an awfully long rant to say that I really like this this whole section of your book. I just feel like you really hit the nail exactly on the head because it is difficult to quantify sometimes what we can get out of Freemasonry. But to me, it really can become this vehicle for self-transformation and for building meaning in a world that's so full of cynicism and superficiality. So yeah. I was wondering if you, you had any thoughts on that. Well, sure. So... It kind of, I don't know if I wrote this in that essay or not, but something I think about in the vicinity of that, you know, complex of thoughts is, uh, is the lost word, you know, the, the whole symbolism of the lost word. Um, and you know how they sometimes say, well, they'll give you the lost word in the chapter or in, or, at, you know, whatever degree it is of the Scottish right. And it's like, I don't want the lost word. Nobody wants the lost word because if you give somebody the lost word, then it ceases to, it becomes a sign, not a symbol. It, it ceases to become something actionable. You know, it becomes some, uh, reliquary or whatever you know it just becomes something but um that that quest you use the word quest um makes me think of the the lost word because we're not supposed to necessarily find that you know we're supposed to uh engage in the quest for it the the search for the lost word and i think if if a project provides meaning for people, I would say maybe um, you know a pretty pretty fundamental project that we have as Masons is the quest for the lost word, yeah. um, not the finding of the lost word, but the or the acquisition of the lost word, but the the quest for the lost word. One other thing you mentioned that I that I felt was interesting is. Um, about uh, particularly for men who don't experience maybe I, I think there's something to that um, but would first have to address like why does regular Freemasonry is there something um, is there something uh, what's the word um, is there something misogynistic about or chauvinistic about Freemasonry. And I ha I've worked on this problem before, right? And I've written a, a couple of essays about it some years ago when I was grappling with why don't they let women in? And it's like, it's like, well, you could say that because of the nature of the second half of the third degree, because of the nature of that allegory, which is primarily masculine in nature. I mean, the exemplar for that experience is, 
a man, right? Sure. And there is a certain cycle that lends itself to the to the masculine experience. Um, I would say that's one, and you know, everybody can experience. Let's say Campbell's hero's journey. That's not gendered or whatever, right? Um, but there is something about the second half of the third degree. I th- all Masons will know what that means. That is uh, peculiar to the male experience, I believe. Plus, if you look back, disappearing into prehistory, just on the anthropological level, single sex socialization has been a thing forever. It literally, like, that's just the way that. Um, this has happened. Nobody created that by design in order to be misogynistic or misandronistic, if that's the word, the antithetical word. Um, nobody kind of created this to be sexist. It is, it is an anthropological constant that we have single sex socialization. Now, the other point you can make, I guess a third point on this subject is, uh, women have certain biological cues and certain cultural socio-cultural cues that are not as established in the male experience than in the female experience so there are certain things that happen there are certain milestones in development the development of the female consciousness and you know that are intact in today's society from your quinceanera to your you know your wedding or from your first menstruation etc there are all of these certain milestones and touchstones of development that frankly men are anemic socioculturally anemic in that area yes you have the army you have prison you have street gangs you know to name a few uh, you have Western esoteric traditions, to name perhaps a more healthier option, right? So I think Freemasonry, I don't look at it as being sexist or um, uh, mis... Uh, I keep losing that word. Mis, uh, misogynistic. Misogynistic, yeah. Um, I don't look at it as being that because... It's really like, um, you know, it really helps with that structure for a man. Mm -hmm. Now, one last little piece on that is I have thought about, well, what would be a good um, co-ed kind of unisex experience? What if we were to adopt something like um, Orpheus and Eurydice um, as our sort of central allegory? and use that in a male like the mormons do with the or the lds do with uh endowment and things like that they really have made that um the lds has really made a system where you could use like the garden of eden or other certain narratives that are not so um masculine in nature so there is a way you could do that but you would have to erase what we know about uh craft freemasonry Mm. Am I wrong? I mean, oh, I mean, absolutely. What am I missing there? And you know, I think it's something that we as Masons sometimes shy away from discussing this whole gendered issue, just because it is a, a thorny subject. But it's good just to have frank conversations like this. I think about it because it's going to keep coming up in the future. It's definitely a hot button topic. So, well, it's good to talk about. It. You're right. I feel like there have to be places where men can just be with other men and not be subjected to the same social pressures. And it's not that we, we would act differently. It w- it's just that we would feel differently because we wouldn't be, you know, under uh, always under scrutiny to be a certain way. Um, it's just, it's hard to describe, but, um, I think once you start taking those spaces away, uh, the, the, the sort of reaction that occurs as a result and bo- on both sides is, is rather extreme and unhealthy. I think we can just looking at our culture today, it's pretty obvious to me. I don't know about anybody else, but yeah, yeah, there's, um, 
you know, again, it's sort of a constant and, and there is, there are rather some peculiarities to, uh, the masculine experience that you don't find in the, in the feminine experience and vice versa. You know, I'm not looking to show up at somebody's, um, um, quinceanera because I wouldn't be able to, you know, maybe as a family member just celebrating, but that's, that's not meant for me to experience in a, any sort of meaningful and transformative way. No, I think, you know, it's, you're right. Men take direction from other men in an entirely different way than they take direction from women. And to have a, a strong, stable man as an example to emulate is important because it instills a sense of pride and not in a bad way, but in a way that, you know, is like exalted and not beaten down. Yeah. A refinement. I yeah. guess. And yeah. Anyway. Yeah. It's touchy. It's touchy that whole thing, but <laughs> it is, you know, I think, I think just because it's touchy doesn't mean that we should avoid it. You know, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that it's something. And I, and sadly, I think, um, we've given the wrong impression through lack of, um, critical thinking about it as a craft, you know, we've kind of, well, it's just a place where men can be men, you know? And it's like, well, yeah, that is, that is a thing, but then there's so many other sort of contingencies that we have to define about that. You know, can I not be a man, a man around, you know, in a room full of women? Am I more of a man in a room full of women? You know what I mean? Like how do we, where's the sort of like, so, but yeah, I don't shy away from that. And I, and I also try not to shy away from uh, being wrong, you know, or feeling weird about, or being scared to say something because I might be wrong. You know, I'll just say it less definitively. And then if we have to chop it up and see if it makes sense, I will gladly hand over my bad ideas. Be <laughs> like, okay. Uh, Indeed. It's always good to refine our ideas and discard the bad ones, the, the wrong ones, which all in the end, <laughs> mostly all are. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, that's been my experience. So anyway. Yeah, and it comes with. It comes with embarrassment and pain sometimes, right? Some Certainly. Anxiety. Absolutely. But anything worth doing that should have some element of the ordeal about it, right? Something, Some sort of crucible through which we pass, I yeah, guess. That is life, or it should be anyway. We hope you enjoyed the first part of our interview with author Jamie Paul Lamb. Join us in the Chamber of Reflection for part two of our discussion, where we dive deeper into Masonic symbolism, the tarot, and hermetic wisdom. I wanted to take a moment to share some exciting news from behind the scenes at the Occult of Personality podcast. For quite some time now, our longtime listeners have been requesting a more streamlined and intuitive way of accessing our rich back catalog of archive shows in the Chamber of Reflection. We also recognize that our payment options previously on our website have been rather limited. We heard your feedback loud and clear, and we have been hard at work making some important changes. We are excited to announce that we are rolling out a solution that will give our members special access to a private streaming feed so that you can enjoy the Chamber of Reflection content directly from your favorite streaming app. No need to sign into the website each time. We also now accept a variety of payment options through Square, so you are no longer only limited to PayPal. We hope this makes the overall experience more convenient and intuitive. And if you were ever on the fence about subscribing to the Chamber of Reflection, now is definitely the time to get on board with our new membership offerings. We appreciate your support. This allows us to continue bringing you the top quality interviews and esoteric discussions, which you've come to expect from the Occult of Personality podcast. Thank you.
Yeah.